delete that for now. Um, share your screen, Jody Joe. You gonna have to show me how you did that. What um? Sent it to a hundred people so fast. In the groups, in my groups. Most of the people, oh, yep, I got you. Most of the people is in my groups. What'd you say? Trying to double up. Hey, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Could you hear me? Nah. I was trying to share, I was sharing it. Did you see it? Uh, do it again, I wasn't on the screen. I don't hear you. I don't hear nothing. I don't see nothing. Did you see it? No, I ain't see nothing. I ain't hear nothing. It just turned your uh, your video off. Don't worry what? about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> Working on the dance moves, man. Um, uh, come prepared to with at least five questions. At least five questions. Bro, bro, good morning. Happy Macam uh, Thursday, man. How you feeling? Happy Macam Thursday, Steph. Day -day. Happy Macam Thursday, y'all. How you feeling, bro? Happy hey, no, Macam Thursday. Bro, I'm feeling good, bro. Watching y'all every day be, be motivating me, big bro. Like, hey. Hey man, right on for tapping in. You hear me? Uh, yeah. Hey, I got some good news, bro. I got one chest tube left. What? I got one chest tube left to get out, bro. That's what's up. That's 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 what's up. up. Yeah, that's what's up. That's the move right there. What does that mean? Uh, cause I've been ha I've been having a lot of fluid and stuff. All around my lungs and all that shit, that blood. I, I ain't bleed internally no more. Because I had like four of them holes in me. Feel when I did the, the two videos for you, bro, I had four tubes in me, bro. All Damn. down my, yeah, so. They was even amazed that I was in here talking. You know, them, them, them videos of me walking and all that, bro, I had two. But they still was making me do like the normal everyday stuff, so I don't. I don't lose none of that little strength. Yeah. Right. I got one left, bro. Oh, man. That's yeah. good. Yeah, that's the move right there, my man. Yeah, it is. Yes, indeed. I didn't know you had four tubes in you when you was yeah. doing the interview. Jody Joe, how many times I done told you, boy, I'm Wolverine. Wait. True. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I told you, man, can't that if my mind ain't took away, bro, ain't nothing you gonna stop me from, bro. Period. Right. But how y'all all doing today, man? Man, you know, I was just saying, um, you know, Thursday, my favorite day of the week. You know what I mean? It's the beginning of the end, you know, to me. Right. But you know, it's always a beautiful day for me. I mean, I'm doing cool. I'm doing good. You know what I'm saying? I just wake up and try to motivate people every day. You know what I'm saying? Try to keep them, try to keep a lot of people in my prayers and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Motivate a lot of people in a lot of different ways. That's what's up, bro. Yeah, I'm cool. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> what up, Day Day? Day Day, you stay looking tired on the interview. All right. <laughs> no, hey, 
Hey, that's just his look, bro. Look. Right. Hey, he, hey, he used to be in the basketball game. I should be like, bro, you ready for the game? He'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, yeah. You would that nigga out there. He'd be out there running 100 miles an hour like, damn, bro was looking tired as hell. <laughs> that's just that nigga's look. That's just his look, bro. Hey, Tank joining us today? Uh, Tank, he's uh, packing this stuff, getting ready to leave. Yeah, he can. Uh, Dang, I got a pack tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. You out here? All right, good. Okay. Man, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm glad y'all be having this, though, Phil. Right on, man. Right on. You know what I mean? You know, it was, you know, with this COVID shit, you know what I mean? With us not being able to be in the schools and interact with folks like we used to and like we want to, you know what I mean? We had to still be able to provide something. And you know, my thing is, you know, we learn, we learn best from hearing other people's stories. You know what I mean? How they, how they succeeded, how they failed. So why not provide a platform for that? You know what I mean? Right. That's like I be true. seeing what brother Jeff be doing. But he's real political on that field. You know what I mean? That's good. You know, he had Candy on the show, but don't nobody know Candy. Like, you know I mean? man, I've been going to school with her since she's great, bro. My nigga. <laughs> we, walk, we graduated the same year. We walked right. across that, that same, same stage, stage yep. at Manuel, bro. Like, and people yep. used to look down on her, like, like I swear, like, and to see her where she's at, like, oh, my God. Yep. Like, and she come from right there where we come from. Right mm-hmm. here, bro. Yep. To where I ain't gonna lie, she didn't have to. De- the reason why the detective didn't hurry up working on my case, the detective called me last week. He was like, "Man, you 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 know Councilman Debaker?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> well, how you know her? So I, I broke it down to where he was. He I ain't gonna lie, he was a little bullshit on the case. Ever since I don't know what she called and told that man. He called me an hour ago. <laughs> now he keeping me all updated on everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, that's how she was with us. So you know, Andre had gotten to a little shit at Manual. You know what I mean? Uh huh. So you know, uh, he's gonna be in. You know what I mean? But she was just asking him. You know, did you have it or not? Was it yours or not? And he was like, Nah, it wasn't mine. It was mine. She like, All right, say no more. She had met his uh public. He she she had met his uh, uh his attorney, his little public pretender, at some uh-huh. kind of little little banquet thing. She came to me, was like, no, she had called me. And she was like, yeah, Councilwoman C. Debaca, she had, she was really pressing me. <laughs> like, she be she on it, bro. It. Like, she be on it. Hey, hey, Without you know, a cuss that. word. Hey. No, no, like, none of that. She ain't cussing at you or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And, you know, there's a whole lot of shit, you know, politically that, you know, all a whole lot of behind the scenes shit that we don't even hear about, my nigga. You right. know what I mean? These little victories and shit that we be winning is behind her. You know what yeah. I mean? And her leading the movement and shit like that. So, you know, she she's one of them right folks that we got. You know, I was just talking to Young Huff yesterday. You know, what, you know what I mean? He was just saying how politics ain't it. You know what I mean? And just seeing what it is. And I'm I'm telling him. You know, in order for us to make a true impact, we got to be able to fight in that political arena. You, you know what I mean? Have That's the only way. Got to. And you know, That's I'm pushing. The only way. And, and you know, I told Huff, when you run for mayor, I'm gonna be your first vote. Yeah, you I know what promise I mean? you. I promise you. Know, you. That's the only way <laughs> that we can beat the system is from inside of the system, bro. You know what I mean? So you know, with yeah. Candy, she she she's doing the exact. She's doing it right now. You know what I mean? She's inside that system working it. You know, so we just gotta get more of the right people, you know what I mean, in there instead of these who put as Yeah, know. man. I already know. Yeah. <laughs> That's why as long as we stay, I feel like we as long as we stay on the kids, bro, and let them see that like we even know people like that or it's okay to go join that avenue, like where they ain't gotta be. It's gonna happen, bro. Like, I mean, but you know the thing is, though, you know we 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 are reaching the youth. We are reaching we are reaching the youth. You know, but when I say the youth, I'm talking 16, 17, 15, 14, 13. You know, we reaching the youth. 
you know, the, the ones that we're not reaching, the 19, the 26, 28 Six year olds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those was right there. So that until the ones that we're reaching grow up, until they get older, my nigga, we're going to continue to experience these losses. Yeah, we you're right. We, we will continue to experience these losses right now because there's a there's an avenue, there's a there's a audience that we're not reaching. You know, they don't want to be reached type shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know. Are you right on that up, one? When they grow up, then we'll see our the fruits of our labor. Yeah. You know what I mean? You hear me? Yeah. So, you know, we just got to keep on keeping on and not expect no overnight shit. You know what nah, I mean? ain't going to happen. Yeah, that's you know, what's up. Right yeah, man. yeah, man. But um, I do want to, you know, once you once you start moving and shit, once you get back on your feet and shit like that, even um, even like now too, I want to rap with you to see how we can plug you into what we doing. You know what I mean? Man, I'm with it, bro. Like I said, bro, I can walk and all that. I just, I just told them until they figure out everything that they need to figure out, like. Cause I don't want, I didn't want to keep walking around with them tubes and all of that. Honestly, bro, I might be home in a week. Like, bro, I can functionally walk. Only thing that's that's really, really, really messed up is my right arm is unfunctionable at all. Like that mug, mm. <laughs> that mug is done. I'm all the way lefty now for a minute. <laughs> oh man, straight up. But man, I'm I'm with it, bro. Cause I'm glad you bring up that 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 little uh what you say 19 to 26 year old because mm-hmm. I got a I got I got this one little bro where little bro is lost Joe little uh Jody know him. like he was hanging out with a uh, he was kicking it with me like two three months strong before for this little shit happened like he was out here field on the street drinking and shit smart little cat he's smart as hell but he would always be drinking always be drinking. So he started hanging with me. He, I met him at one of my first little shows. Then I started seeing more and more of who he is. I'm like, damn little bro is lost in the mud. I'm talking mm-hmm. about lost. So uh uh what was that the day before or that night I had got hit, he had went off on some weird shit. So and I heard you talking to I think it was Trey Ryder yesterday about the about the not snitching and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, when Trey Ryder was like, once you join that life, you ain't gonna talk to the police. So little, little, little bro was supposed to go meet with the detective on Monday. Where I had to, the detectives call me today, like, man, well, you know, Mr. Cedric ain't came and talked to me. And I just told the cops straight up, you and I both know you're the gang member and he ain't gonna come talk to you. <laughs> Even if it is, him not being no involvement in my shooting, he still ain't going to go to even clear his goddamn name. Like, I mean, and, really- and, that's, and that's the, and that's the, that's the crazy part, my nigga, because we, we build, we built this environment. We built this culture of self-destruction. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that thing Nipsey said it best, man. You know what I mean? This culture that we building is we building it for self destruction. You know what right. I mean? Man. I I feel I feel horrible that you just saying that shit stuff because I would have been the type of person to go down there and to clear like, my name, I mean, especially you know, if like, you my bro. Yeah, he, if that's what that's what I'm saying. Bro, that's what like, I'm sitting here thinking. Like you gonna go and just see what's up just because oh, no, I'm gonna go see what's up just so I can even let bro know what's up or something. That's all I'm thinking. I ain't right. I ain't thinking this fool gonna literally be like. And fuck that, man. I ain't going to the to where I know that's what he thinking. Like, nigga, I ain't going to the police, girls. Fuck that. You niggas ain't finna. Like, bro, and if you don't have no involvement, so now I'm sitting here like, hmm. Yeah, right. Right. My mom and them couldn't find you that night. My dad called you, you my wife. Night. You called him. Elijah called him. He didn't reach nobody until shit. I don't know. I already had three or four surgeries into the Next day, then you call about three or four in the afternoon, talking about well, what happened and all this other crap. Now you got me thinking, like, bro, even if you didn't do something, bro, you know something. You know something, and you have something to do with it. And I told you that when I talked to you. I told you that when I talked to you, nigga. I'm, I'm over the situation because it's stupid, nigga. You supposed to be my bro. You supposed to go there 
I don't care. You supposed to go to the bathroom if you my bro. Nigga. Yeah, that, that's who it, yeah. Like, bro, you ain't snitching on nobody. Right. Like, <laughs> if I see him in the street, I'm going to take his head off. No, gonna, bro, bro. No, bro. I'm going to punch him. I'm just going to walk up behind him and stick ain't him Ain't no need for run. all that, bro. Ain't no need for it. Ain't no need for it, bro. They, 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 they picking. They didn't already pick and chose. They battles with what they want to do, bro. Right. You gotta keep doing what we doing, bro, to make us better, bro. We can't. Is it fucked up? Hell yeah, but bro, at the end of the day, that he gonna have to live with that shit. The guilt. Like some gonna, like I said, some gonna transpire. Always do to where the truth gonna come out anyway. Period. I ain't I just don't want none of mine's going to go put they self in no danger in that way to where it's continuing that fucked up cycle. Nah, hell no. Nah. We got Councilman DeBaca on, on helmets. She going to figure something out. I promise you. She going to make something. Yeah. Like I said, she already got the detective moving like to where he's like, nah, man. To where he had to apologize for even that first week for treating me like a gangbanger. Like, that he called and apologized. Feel talking about man. I'm, I'm sorry, man. Because most of our, our 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 victims that get shot down there are gang members or the the situation is gang related. He done put off to like two or three of his cases to 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 try to figure out mine. He's like, no, you're you're active in the community trying to help. He's like, and this one has, is not sitting well with. You. But hell yeah, bro. He had to apologize because he profiled, which was sad, bro. Right. He, he he did that shit. Thanks to Candy though. Hell yeah. Hey, Candy. I missed it. What what were you saying? <laughs> no nah, man, you had the you the 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 the, the uh, detective ended up apologizing uh for for <laughs> when the when the situation first started is before I had talked to you. He was treating me like I was a gangbanger to where once I had talked to you and and we did all that, yeah. He done, he done changed his whole everything. Like that was he's one to one to actually really help and figure out what the hell happened versus taking his sweet time and treating it like it's just some normal little hood shooting. I made him sit down and like grilled the shit out of them. <laughs> There's some, they showed me the videos. I made them walk through the videos, every single address, the routes that they were checking. Like, it's shady to me what they're doing. And I feel like your case just is the, the thing that, like, helped me understand how they're consolidating their investigations under one team. They're not even letting the district police investigate it. They send all shootings to one team, which makes me feel like, what if, you know, they're doing the shootings to create this perception that the neighborhood is dangerous or like, what are, what if they're just controlling the investigations mm -hmm. because right. they know what's happening? Right. right. All right, before we get into that, before we get into this, you know, it's about to be juicy, I already know. <laughs> <laughs> As you see, wait, wait. Thinking, well, tell thinking, me the structure. Thinking, yeah, she's going to go ahead and break it down for you right now. Okay. Hi, my name is Aja, and I'm the person that's going to be introducing you and everything today. So before like, I go into that, can you um, tell me like, what you want me to introduce you as and if there's anything that you want me to put out there before you tell your story? Um, Candy Sadevaca, uh, manual graduate, Eastsider. City council person. Okay. Can you pronounce your last name one more time? Se de Baca. Okay. Se de Baca. Yep. Can you say de Baca? Yep. Okay. Eastside. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Eastside <laughs> manual. Eastside manual graduate at that. <laughs> okay. Um, so then if someone has a question, then they'll use either this emoji or they'll um, raise their hand in the chat like literally and so if you could like pause your story and address their question and then you know uh, continue where you left off okay and um, yeah I think that's pretty much it and the 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 platform the template is you know you're gonna is this this is a conversation you know you're gonna share your choices I mean you're gonna share your story the choices that you made that got you to where you are right now okay. all right and within that within you sharing your story I'm sure there's going to be questions that we're gonna have, and like I just said, 
if you see anybody raise your hand, you know, as the facilitator too, she's going to be mindful of that. And she'll politely interrupt you, you know, just so that we can get the question answered and then keep moving forward. All right. Cool. Um, do I have to start with my story? Because I, I, I usually start before I was born. So. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. that's a part of your story, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, and you know, with this, we are streaming live on YouTube, but it's private right now. Can nobody see it? Okay. All right. Any other questions you got? Thank you. Thank you again, Candy, for tapping in with us. This is going to be dope. All right. And y'all know, y'all don't know, um, you know, we had Candy come to Manual, you know what I mean, to do the art of storytelling there. You know, my ass. You know what I mean? I had. I don't know what happened, but I had her scheduled for another day. So she called me at manual in the class like, um, I, I think I'm here. Where are you at? I'm like, oh, shit. I looked at my calendar like, oh, no. You know, I'm like, I'm going to call. I'm going to call and I'm going to go ahead and counsel, get a teacher. She like, no, nah, I'm going to go ahead and still do it. You know what I mean? She came through and ran the whole class like it was nothing. You know, didn't miss a beat. You know, and the next day the students was talking, you know, in terms of you was probably in that class day day. You know what I mean? I, I think I was. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I think I yeah. did. I think I was. <laughs> yeah, but it was dope, though. You know what I mean? Just in terms of, you know, when she left and I came back the next day, you know, I got to get the feedback. And it's always, you know, it was good. She was real. You know, she came and she told it to us like it is, you know, so. Um, it was good feedback. It was good feedback. And I was just telling people, too, I was tell telling specifically that fun how in order for us to make a true impact, we got to fight from inside the system. You know what I mean? And we got to get more, more of the right people in there to fight from inside, you know? So, but yeah, this is going to be dope. This is going to be dope. Um, go ahead and chill out, relax. I'm going to play some tones. If y'all have any questions, you know what I mean? Let me know. You can turn your video off until um until eleven if you want. Pretty pretty.
Tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. Can't nobody tell a better pay the glory. So tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. Better you the people find it now the more. So tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. Can't nobody tell a better pay the glory. So tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. Better you the people find it now the more. Tell your story, tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. Can't nobody tell a better pay the glory. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another day of the art of storytelling. Um, today we definitely have a special guest. We have City Councilwoman who is also a manual graduate. Her name is Candy Serebaka. I hope yeah. I pronounced that right. Um, but yeah, like I told you earlier, if anybody has a question, then they'll use this emoji to ask their question. And if you could just politely, you know, or if they could politely interrupt if, they, if you don't see it and you can just, you know, pause your story and address their question um, and then continue from where you left off. So with that being said, I'll let you start. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me today. It's such an honor to talk to you all. Um, as she said, my name is Candy Sedebaca. Um, my story started in the East Side. I'm a fifth generation East Sider um, to a single mom. And so I'll get into my story in a minute. But because I have worked with young people all my life and been a facilitator, I want to start off with an activity. And I can see your faces, so you got to play along with me. So I want everybody to close their eyes for a second. And I want you to think hard about all of the square-shaped objects in the room that you're in and count them. When you've counted most of them, open up your eyes. Okay, throw out some numbers. Tell me, tell me some numbers of the square things that you've counted. 10. 6. 17. 11. 6. Okay. Now I want you to take 30 seconds to look around your room for the square shaped things. Look hard for all the ones that you missed. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a minute. So take in all I'm that you can. Ask when they close the door. Yep. I've got some Tylenol. So now close your eyes one more time and see if you can remember more square things than you did the first time. Maybe even count how many more you remember than you did the first time. And open your eyes when you're finished. Did we get any, did we get any higher numbers that second time after we paid attention for the square things? Yes, 27. All right. So I like to start with that activity because, you know, what I recognize throughout my story and my life is the power of focus and setting an intention. And when you know what you're looking for, when you know what you're going to have to remember, you pay more attention to those things. And so I didn't learn that right away, but I, I've learned that over time. And each year brings my perspective and focus uh, into more into more clarity. So I'll start where I think my story starts. Um, I'm the impossible great great granddaughter of a colonizer and the colonized. My great grandma was a Spaniard and my great great grandfather was an indigenous man to this land. And for whatever karmic purposes, they fell in love and they were both disowned by their birth families for choosing each other. They had 13 children on a beet farm here in Northern Colorado. 
and they were sharecroppers and moonshiners by night. Do you guys know what moonshiners are? They made, they made illegal alcohol uh, back when alcohol was not legal. Um, there were 11 sisters and a single boy. And one of those 11 sisters was my Nana, my great grandma. And I like to start with her story because I think that she's the ancestor who brought me here. She wasn't the youngest or the oldest of the 13, but she was the one who suffered seizures from epilepsy and still outlived all of her siblings and most of their kids. Um, because of the, the seizure, seizures that she had, she wasn't able to go much further than the second grade in school. She'd have a seizure in the middle of the street walking to school and the other kids would beat her up and kick her seizing body around for entertainment and leave her there um, all by herself. And so her parents, they kept her home to work in the fields instead because they felt like she was safer there. And so she was forced really early to exist in a battle for her life, but she was a firecracker. She was the life of every single party. She taught herself how to read in spite of only getting to second grade. And she taught herself how to fight. She, she even made a joke about how she met my um, great grandpa. She always said she won him in a bar fight. Um, she had my grandma and my grandma's little brother four years before World War II drafted their dad and um, essentially killed my great great grandpa. He, he died um, from shrapnel, which are the pieces of a bomb in war. And so she was left all alone to raise my grandma and her little brother. And of course, like many people we know, she had to find a way to deal with that. And so she became an alcoholic and spent a lot of my grandma's formative years away from her in the bar. And my grandma didn't learn affection. And in many ways, she learned to maintain emotional distance so that she could cope with an alcoholic parent. And like many, parent, many children of addicted parents, she also learned how to be an enabler. My grandma had three kids of her own and my mom was the oldest. My mom was told in her teenage years that she wasn't gonna be able to have kids. Something was wrong with her, her uterus. And so she didn't plan on, on being a mother but that was really the only thing she ever wanted to be. Um, my auntie, her little sister had kids when she was a teenager. Um, my mom was 24 when she met a married man and her dream to become a mom came true. All she ever wanted in life was to be a mom. And in, in spite of being told she couldn't, here she was pregnant with me. And so I came into the world with very little coaxing. She said I was the easiest birth that she had. Um, my little brother and little sister, um, they almost both claimed her life each time. And so by the time I got to this world, my ancestral plans were already in motion. And I was born, I was brought into this space that I was, that the world said I wasn't gonna be able to come into. And my mom, you know, even though she wanted to be a mom, she didn't know how. And because she had kids with a married man, she didn't, she didn't have anybody to help her raise us except for my grandma and my great grandma. And so I was born on my great grandma's birthday. And that's why I believe that she's the ancestor who brought me into this world. Um, because she helped my mom raise us, I spent most of my time with my great grandma growing up. And so she taught me everything she knew. She taught me how to take what people tell you you can't do and prove them wrong. And so to a single mother, I, you know, was born on basically nothing. We had nothing. My mom was on public assistance. We were living in my grandma's house until my mom had to go out on her own and we were in section eight and I was taking care of my little brothers and sisters when I was barely tall enough to reach the lock on the door. I would sit with my mom when she would go clean offices at night 
and I would sit under the table in conference rooms of these big buildings, wondering what happened in the daytime, you know, watching her collect the trash and wipe things down, but not sure what was happening in the daytime in these big fancy offices. And I would sit under that table wishing that one day I would be able to run a meeting at one of those tables or um, be the boss at one of those tables. And I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't know what it was like to know those kind of people or to get to that kind of space. And so in school, I did all the things that, you know, people told you you were supposed to do. In schools like ours, people said, you've got to go to college, you've got to get grades so you can get out of your community. That was what success was in the schools that I was raised in. And um, I believed it for a long time. I believed that what success was, was getting out of my community. And so, you know, we, I, 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 basically threw myself into my schoolwork because we didn't, you know, my mom was a single mom working all the time. Um, she was very depressed, had significant mental health issues, was very abusive, um, physically, uh, verbally. And I had to be the mom in a lot of ways, but school was my refuge. And when I got to high school, I had my first I guess, political experience and political awakening. Um, when I was in elementary school, I was in some gifted and talented classes. But when I got to high school, the gifted and talented program was called IB and they didn't have it in my neighborhood school. And so people were trying to convince me to leave my neighborhood to stay in the gifted and talented track. And I refused because you know, I knew my grandpa went to Emmanuel and didn't get to finish. He had to drop out to work. And so I had this determination to be the first person in my family to graduate from high school, but not just graduate from high school, graduate from the school where my grandpa left off at, because I've always had Can this I sense of living out my ancestors um, and my family's unfinished business. Sorry Is there a question? Off, we, um, we had two questions from um, Mr. Phil. And Go for it, Phil. Um, I was just asking, I was wondering what kind of uh, what kind of male influence did you have on you growing up if you didn't have? So I'm, I'm assuming your uh, your biological dad wasn't around. No. And so <laughs> that was an interesting one because um, when I said my mom lived in section eight, we lived in this triplex and we were getting evicted one time. And I remember I was about five years old and I was throwing my belongings in the dumpster crying because we didn't know where we were gonna go. And there was this neighbor who lived across the alley from us and in a neighborhood that was 100% black and brown, um, there was this one white man and he was the neighbor who was out at the dumpster who lived across the alley. And he asked me why I was crying. And I told him that we had to leave and I, and I had to throw away all my things. And he was like, no, no, pick up your stuff. I'm gonna go talk to your mom. So he takes me back in the house and sits down with my mom and my mom sends us out to go play. And what I, what I figured out later was that his mom had just passed away and his mom lived in the corner house and he lived in the next house. And so what he ended up doing was letting my mom move into the house um, and live there for free and move in with us so that we could stay in the neighborhood, so that we could stay housed. And so my mom could get off of, um, get off of public assistance and get a job and um, really have a shot. And so we did that and him and my grandma started dating and <laughs> my grandma ended up marrying him and he became my grandpa. And it was, it was kind of a moment where I felt like the secrets of the world were opened up to me. The secrets of white supremacy um, were opened up to me in a way that they don't typically get opened up to us. Um, white people raise their kids differently. You know, my, my mom 
when she said no, it was because no means no. We didn't get an explanation. And white people, when we talk about them having privilege and entitlement, it's real. They don't teach their kids that no means no. They teach their kids how to negotiate an authority, how to challenge authority, how to feel entitled to a yes. And so his influence on me, um, and because I naturally spent most of my time with my grandma and great grandma, he was now a part of that. He became like the dad to me. And it was weird at first because it was such a, a different way than I was used to, but he challenged me to think in different ways and to put myself um, on a pedestal and to not see myself as less than people, to not see myself as just poor or just brown. And his family hated us. His family disowned him for marrying my grandma because we were Mexican. And, you know, that was my first real encounter with racism, but also at the same time um, with white people who weren't racist or who were actively trying to undo racism. Because while his family hated us, you know, he didn't see us um, as less than him. And so I remember his influence was really what challenged me to um, get to yes, to always see the, the possibilities in a situation. And that activity we did in the beginning was something that he actually taught me. Um, when, when we're raised in communities where that are plagued by poverty or disadvantage, sometimes the only thing we're taught to focus on or we're not taught to focus, we're taught to focus on the, the negative um, or the limitations or the no's. And what he taught me was to be very intentional about focusing on possibilities and how to get around a limitation, no matter what it takes. Um, I ended up having to apply that very differently, differently than he had to apply it in his life. But, you know, when we lost him, um, I, he, he passed away when I was a sophomore in high school. I had moved out of my house already. I moved out of my house, out of my mom's house when I was 14. Um, my mom's, my mom found a, a husband who was basically trying to rape me. And when I told her that he was trying to do that, she didn't believe me. And she thought I was trying to cause problems between them. And so I had already moved out of my house at 14. And when I was 15, my grandpa passed away. And so I moved in with my grandma to take care of her. Um, I moved in from my boyfriend's house. Um, and Can I so- Can interrupt you really fast? I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, pretty sure ahead. we have another question. Go for it. Keep going. You got to stop me because I can't see the hands pop up. Okay. What's the question? Go ahead, Jody. Uh, my fault. I was um, just going to ask you, like, you going through all that, what was your motivation? My motivation at that time was to get out. Um, I still believed this idea of success being that I had to get out. I had to get away from my community. I had to get away from my family in order to be successful. And so keeping my eyes on the prize meant staying focused on school so I could get out. And so all of that um, was happening in my life and I'm running my grandma's household, taking care of her, taking care of my siblings and still just killing it at school, just doing everything I could to get straight A's so I could get scholarships. I stayed at Manual. I didn't go to the gifted and talented program. Um, and at that time we were being experimented on because they broke manual up into three schools. And so that was the political experience that was starting to, to shape my understanding of what was happening in the world. Um, I made it. I, I was the first person in my family to graduate. I graduated as valedictorian. I had a full ride scholarship, the Daniels Fund, and was on my way to California. And I- I'm sorry to interrupt one more time. We have another question from Andre. Okay. Go for it. 
Hold on, can she finish that thought before we continue, please? Sorry, go ahead. You was on your way to California. I was on my way to California and um, had to leave my sister and my grandma behind. My brother was already hooked on heroin and so he wasn't living at the house. And I moved out to California and my whole world fell apart because I realized that that idea of success was a lie. The game was rigged and my grandma had a heart attack while I was out there. So I'll answer the question and then I'll get back on track. What was the question? Um, you had said um, that you distanced, you distanced yourself from your family, but you had moved in with your grandma to take care of her. So like when you did that, how, like, how did it work? Like your mom and your brothers, they didn't come around or like- so so it was pretty fucked up when um, I moved in with my grandma. I found out um, that while my grandpa had cancer and he was dying, um, he had to go back to work because he didn't have any money. He had spent all his retirement. And I found out that my mom um, had been, hadn't been paying her rent and her husband hadn't been paying his part of the rent. And so my poor grandpa was using all of his money and my grandma's money um, from retirement to pay my mom and her husband's bills. And so at 15 years old, um, I had to kick my mom out of the house. I kicked my mom and her husband out of my out of the other house um, because we needed to, to make some money uh, me and my grandma needed to make some money for me and my sister and there was no other way I was in school and I couldn't work full time and so we ended up kicking my mom out um, and um, I was still working we didn't it didn't it didn't work out we couldn't get anybody to rent the house because back then nobody wanted to move into our neighborhood and the house was pretty beat up so my mom just left. She moved to Montbello and um, I didn't have to see her very much. And it was just me, my grandma and my sister really. And so that's kind of how the boundaries naturally happened. Um, but it, it wasn't easy. It, it caused a huge family feud um, because my grandma had to give all of her power and authority to a freaking 15 year old um, because she didn't know how to pay her bills. She didn't know how to take care of herself. She had mostly relied on men to take care of her most of her life. And I wasn't gonna take care of the bills and not have the authority to cut off people who were just sucking off our resources and not helping us out, including right. my mom. Right. Um, we have another question from Stefan. Go ahead. You're on mute. Oh, I ain't really have a question, but I'm gonna tell you, thank you for not going to that gifted and talented school. <laughs> Cause I wouldn't have been able to be in them classes with you, Candy. And like I said, feeding off of your energy for all them years in school and not even knowing what you are going through right now and being at school with you every day is shocking. It's crazy as hell. Like, I seen you every day from fucking sixth grade till we was down there seniors and shit. That shit's crazy. I'm just saying thank you for not leaving us because we <laughs> needed your push at school. I promise you. Well, that's, a, that's a perfect segue for um, this epiphany that I had when I got to college. Um, uh, before you go I, into that segue, okay. I, I saw Jody Joe, he had a question too. Um, I was just going to ask her, like, you, um, your grandma, you kicking your mom out, your grandma giving, first off, your grandma giving you the authority, authority at 15. Um, you kicking your mom out because you guys needed to, you guys needed the money, you know what I'm saying? Nobody was trying to rent the room because you lived in the east side and all that. Would you say that all this took a turn in your life and also you grew up fast? very fast. Um, 
I don't think I ever got the luxury of being a kid. Um, not only because I always felt this sense of responsibility to my ancestors because I was raised by my great grandma, but you know, I, I never got the luxury of being, of not knowing something, of not um, having to take control of the situation um, to keep us on track. So it definitely, it, it changed my life forever to have to be the adult in that moment and to set those boundaries with my own flesh and blood, the, the woman who brought me into the world. Um, but it, it strengthened me for later and it'll, it'll fold back into my story later. Um, any more questions? Okay. Um, before you continue, I have one, sorry. Um, what's your relationship with your mom like now? I'll get to that part. You have to wait okay. for that one. Um, uh, and Margaret, she has a question too. Okay. Hi, Candy, sorry. Hey, I want to ask about, can you talk about the invisibility of Latinx women and your experience with that? Yeah, so when this actually all folds well into this um, college epiphany. So I remember um, in my college classes, I was sitting in classrooms thinking that, you know, I had gotten to the place where all the smartest people in the world would be. Um, and I was sitting in class with some of the dumbest fucking kids I've ever met in my life. And I thought about people like Stefan. I thought about people like um, this kid I knew named William Galbraith, um, my best friend, Eliana, and they were so smart. And these were kids at Manual. And these were kids that didn't get to go to college. And so I started to, to realize, you know, that the kids in college were no different, no smarter, no better than the kids I grew up with. And they were, the system was designed to keep the kids I grew up with from not going to college. And I remembered why all of a sudden they want, I remembered why they tried to make me go to this special school for talented kids. Um, it was a way to like filter out some of us to let some of the well-behaved ones through, to let some of the ones who believed in this idea of assimilation as success and to leave the rest behind. And so staying in my community um, to realize the brilliance of my community um, and be able to compare the kids in college to that was really important. At the same time, I was in my first Chicano studies class in college. And I didn't even know what a Chicana was when I got to college, to be honest with you. Um, I was flipping pages, learning about the Aztecs, learning about how the Southwest and Colorado used to be part of Mexico and I started understanding, you know, why I never really fit into a group. My family was here. We didn't, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And so I was never Mexican enough growing up to fit into the Mexican groups at school, but I was also not black. And so I, I lived in this middle space that I eventually learned to define as Chicana. Um, I identified with the blackness of my indigeneity because my my great grandma as an indigenous person you know she was dark skinned she was a sharecropper and she was visibly not white um and so i this chicana identity started to resonate started to help me understand where i fit in the world um at the i was flipping pages in that class also learning about the Chicano movement and how it happened in Denver and how it happened in East Denver and how the leader of the Chicano movement went to a school named Manuel. And these were things that I had never learned about before. And it, it, it infuriated me. I remember it being in my dorm crying 
because nobody ever told me this stuff about my neighborhood. Nobody ever told me this stuff about my school. People led a freaking revolution at the same time that the civil rights movement was happening, Latinos here in Denver were leading their own civil rights movement and nobody ever told us that. And so while I'm figuring out that the game is rigged, I'm also understanding that they keep information of us, information from us so we don't feel powerful. So we don't feel like there's a model that has already happened that we can build off of and that we can use to make our communities feel powerful and know that they're powerful and can accomplish things. I feel like there, is there a question? Okay, good. I thought I saw one. And so all of this stuff is happening and I have to also figure out how to deal with my grandma's heart attack back home because she doesn't have insurance. Um, at this point, my sister's heavy into drugs. My brother, he's still in, do, shooting up heroin. Um, my grandma's gonna lose the house because my sister didn't pay the bills. Um, and because the, the surgeon who had to do her heart surgery after her heart attack, they put this thing called a lien on the house um, because she couldn't pay her, her hospital bills. And so I have this moment where I have to decide what does success really mean to me? If I don't believe that success means going away anymore, then what is success to me? And so I decided in that moment that success was going back to my community and telling my community these secrets um, that I had just learned and helping them understand that we're kept in the dark for a reason to make us less powerful. And so I moved back to Denver after my first year of college and transferred over to DU. I was gonna drop out of school, but my scholarship wouldn't let me. Um, they, my liaison just you know, refused to let me quit, made me um, go to DU, transfer to a school that was similar and helped me understand that to accomplish the goals that I wanted to accomplish, in my community, I needed a ticket to play the game. And so I stayed in school, but immediately got involved in what was going on at Manual. And they were trying to shut Manual down at this point because that little reform that they tried while I was there didn't work. Go figure, we told them it wasn't gonna work, um, but it didn't work and they were closing it. And I wanted to help the students out. And so, I got really involved in trying to organize our community to file a lawsuit against DPS um, for basically discriminating or educational malpractice um, with black and brown kids. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. Is there a question? Okay. Um, and so we were organizing the community. I'm going to college. Um, I end up shacking up with this guy because I need help paying rent and um, he's somebody I went to school with and so we got engaged. He turned out to be really abusive. Um, it took me a long time to figure it out because I was so used to being abused. Um, so I was juggling all this like I knew how. Um, always just a lot of drama. I was always just all kinds of drama but using school and my community to stay focused. Um, we ended up going through this whole process. DPS decided to, um, work with us if we would drop the lawsuit and they would let us help renew manual, um, redesign the opening. And so I participated in this process for a year. And when we got down to the final report that they presented to the school board, none of the community's input was included. Um, none of the years long worth of research that I did was part of that report. And so, again, I saw what the political structure does to shut us up, to make us feel like they're listening. When they're really not listening, they're just checking a box. And so Project Voice was born um, because 
we were so angry after participating in that process, but we didn't want that to happen again in our community to someone else. I didn't want anybody else to get fooled the way that I got fooled. And so a friend named Brian Barha, um, this, this guy who had started Youth Biz, he had participated and he was trying to help me channel my anger. And he asked me, you're angry, but what do you want to do about it? What do you want to make out of that anger? And it was, it was that bringing me back to a intentionality and focus. And so we decided to start an organization and he helped me figure out how to do that because he had already done it before. And so Project Voice was an organization that we started to insert youth voice into education policy and education and school renewals. Um, at the time, you know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know how to start an organization. And I didn't know much about policy, um, but I was determined to learn. And we, I think the best thing that we learned, that I learned from that situation was how to organize people, how to teach my community to um, leverage their skills and talent for the things that they wanted. And so we did that. Um, I was going through school dealing with racist professors at DU, um, ultimately ended up graduating in five years with two degrees because they told me when I transferred from San Diego that I wasn't gonna graduate um, in time and that all my classes in San Diego were a waste, but I refused to let them, I refused to believe that. And in fact, I was just like, well, I'm gonna show them that not only am I gonna graduate in four years here at DU, I'm also gonna take two, two degrees with me um, since they're free, since my scholarship is paying for them. And so I became the first and youngest uh, dual degree graduate at DU. Um, even with um, a major fight with the university six months before graduation because of a racist professor who tried to block me from passing a class that she was teaching because I refused to cite her work about um, what it, what uh, community development looks like in black and brown communities. This is a white woman telling me what community development should look like with my people. And I refused to cite her work and she took it as an, a major insult. And so she tried to stop me from graduating. Um, I didn't find out until two weeks before graduation that I was actually gonna graduate, um, but I waged war against that university um, for those entire six months and ended up getting um, an internship out in Washington, DC. Um, so the week after I graduated, I moved immediately out to Washington, DC. I see a question. Oh, uh, no, I was, that was just a uh, applaud because oh. I thought that was really a deep point that you made about when we have white instructors, white professors who try to tell black and brown people about black and brown people. Um, and we encounter that so much at the higher ed level. Um, so thank you for speaking on that. That's it, keep going. Thank you. So leaving to DC was um, good timing for me because while I was fighting the university on um, that situation, um, I had also my, my personal relationship with the guy I was engaged to um, had gotten really dangerous. Um, he started to feel a very, um, a very, he started to feel threatened by not only my education, um, but the work I was doing in the community and um, the community respect that I started to, to build he felt less than a man. And in the Latino community, 
Um, there are some very rigid gender roles. And for me to not be barefoot and pregnant at home went against everything that him and his family believed a woman should be. And so he kidnapped me twice. Um, he tried to murder me. Um, it was it was a very bad situation. And so moving to DC immediately after graduation um, was good for a range of reasons, um, including that one. And so I moved out to DC for this four month inter internship. And so, this was one year after Obama got elected. Go ahead, so, Bill. So with, so with that situation, did you call the police on him? Yeah, and, and I feel really stupid because the first time I called the police, um, I ha so he had kidnapped me and was basically trying to take me to Mexico. And we had driven, he had driven hours away from Denver after beating me for hours. And he fell asleep in the car because he had passed out drunk. And I was trying to flash down some help um, on the middle of a highway in, in the middle of nowhere. And we, I finally was successful, a car pulled over and then a semi pulled over and they came into the car to get me. And um, I, they, they ended up calling the cops and the police came, they took me to the hospital and I had nobody, I had nobody at home who could drive hours out there to get me. And so a volunteer from the hospital drove me back to Denver. And when I got home, um, you know, I'm spinning, I'm, I'm trying to understand what's, what to do, what's happening. And his family starts threatening me. His family um, starts telling me that I need to get him out of jail. Um, they had helped me do some improvements at the house. Um, he had been paying the rent while I was in school. And so they just started to like, ho like hold their power over me. And they forced me to go back to the, j to the, to the cops out there where we were at um, and tell them I lied and help them get an attorney to get him out of jail. And I did it. And so I got him out of jail and they had promised me that they would keep him away from me if I got him out. Of course, that wasn't true. He came, he came back the next day and he like begged to live with me again. And I was so close to finishing school that I didn't feel like I was going to be able to pay, to pay the bills without him. And so I took him back and let him live at the house and, it, and nothing really changed. Um, he, was, he was very jealous of my coworkers at Project Voice. Um, he was jealous of the students that we were working with. And so he became really, more, he, he became more abusive. Um, and finally um, in Colorado, when there's domestic violence, they don't rely on the victim to press charges anymore. The state presses charges now. And so even though I had went back and recanted my story, um, the state still pressed charges on him. And so he ended up, I dodged a subpoena for a year, um, jumping over my fence to go to school because they were waiting outside of my house for me. They ended up serving me the subpoena outside of my class in college. Campus security led them right to me. And so I, I ended up having to, to testify against him um, when, when it was his, his time to go to trial. And so he ended up having to turn himself in and go to jail for about a year. Um, but, before, um, but before he turned himself in, um, you know, I, that was when I was, you know, trying to, to, to make a break for it, trying to get away from him. And so the second time um, I, I called the cops was when he got out of jail and he was stalking me. Um, I had already basically moved on 
but I didn't leave. I didn't leave where I lived. So he came right back to my house, broke into my house, um, tried to stab me, made me take all these pills. Um, it was crazy. And so he's still on the run today. To this day, the cops haven't found him. Mm. Uh, I see Andre has a question too. Go ahead. Um, so you have said like you had, they have forced you to take it, like they have to go up there and get them out and like recant your story. And then like, you said you did, but I don't understand why if you were so close to being done with school, like he could have, he could have, like, I don't understand why. Like he could have stayed in, like, I think he, I believe, well, I feel like he could have stayed in jail and you just had, could have finished school and moved on from there because without, without you going up there the first time, they wouldn't have been able to get him out. Because mm -hmm. they needed you to go up there. I just, yeah. I don't know, that one kind of got me. No, it's true. And, you know, abuse is like a very, abuse is one of those things that it messes with your mind in a way that makes you make irrational decisions. Um, you know, having been abused all of my life, um, it didn't always feel that bad, right? Um there in my head, I was able to say, well, he's good to me most of the time. He helps me take care of the house. He cooks, um, like he takes care of me. And so he's not all bad. In my mind, I didn't completely villainize him. I didn't think that, you know, I should take away his dreams and his life. And for 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 i guess i didn't feel worthy and at the time you know there was no reason there was no reason for me to not feel worthy but it's the cycle of abuse that does that to you and at that point i hadn't had you know enough therapy or um or enough conscious um support around getting over that cycle of abuse and so i i did feel not only did i feel dumb afterwards um i i knew i needed help i knew i needed to go to a therapist i knew i needed to figure out why the hell i would make a decision like that when i was so close when i when i i could easily get away if i needed to and so I jumped into therapy right away um, and he didn't know I had to keep it a secret and go to therapy while I was supposed to be at school. Um, but going to therapy helped me get stronger and helped me know that I was strong enough to leave him and know that I didn't need to rely on him the next time that it happened. It takes, they say it takes women um, or people in abusive relationships at least nine tries on average before they actually leave an abusive relationship. And so for me, it took me, I would say two solid tries. Um, Is, I'm pretty sure we have a question from Dede. Go for it. Well, um, you answered it because I was about to ask, um, how did you say, how did you stay so strong, like getting abused and going like to school and stuff and finishing, but you answered it. So thank you. Um, I know Andre had a follow up and Jody had one after him. Um, I had kind of lost uh, my train of thought. Jody could go right now. Um, one of, well, my question was, excuse my language or whatever from what I'm about to say, but, uh, so would you say all this stuff going on, if it fucked up your mental, your mental state up, up in, up in your brain? Yeah, I would say there were very few things that fixed my mental state. I would say that 
Um, in a lot of ways, I was born with the, the trauma I inherited from all of those stories I told you about the people who came before me. And I, I truly believe that we're all born um, with the trauma of the generations that came before us. Um, and when we come into this life, uh, we're not taught right away how to actively deal with that trauma. And as black and brown people, poor people, I, I feel very passionate about helping people understand that we have to immediately start addressing the trauma um, in our lives to correct the generations of the historical trauma. And so to that, up, up until that point, I hadn't actively tried to ever fix my mental state. And so even though um, that was probably the worst part of it, it was what catalyzed me to start fixing my mental state because I realized it was that negative, it was that poor mental state that led me to that situation, to accept that situation to accept that relationship as what I deserved. And so in that moment, you know, when I started getting stronger in therapy, when I decided to leave to DC, um, I used my time in DC to really fix my mental state, to really start to practice self-care to find out who I wanted to be. I had spent my whole life building myself based on what I didn't wanna be and had no idea what I wanted to be. Um, and so I ended up turning that four month internship that I was supposed to be in DC for into six years in DC. Um, the distance from my family was helpful, but at the same time, you know, my mom died while I was in DC. Um, my, my, my sister and I, we grew apart while I was in DC. Um, a lot of things happened while I was out there that caused a rebirth um, because of how different my life was um, when I came back. When I came back to Denver, um, I was in a completely different situation. I, I don't have the same people in my life who I used to call family. Um, I have a new family. I've learned how to cho choose my family um, based on what I know I deserve as a human being. Um, I've been able to, you know, stay, stay very conscious about what success means to me and not fall for what people say success is money and cars and clothes and all of that none of that matters to me um when i came back to denver i came back because uh, my grandma was dying and i came back basically just to help her die while she was on hospice and um when i came back i saw denver changing so much um that I felt that pull again. I felt that pull to come back to my community and to share all of the beautiful things that I had learned about myself and learned about us as a people and help us try to get on a different track out here. And so instead of going back to DC after my grandma finally passed, I just picked up and moved back to Denver and picked right up where I left off and started fighting some community fights with I-70, um, started fighting um, the disproportionate concentration of the marijuana industry in my neighborhood. Um, we didn't, where we're not even an owner um, in any of it. And so all of that kind of snowballed into running for elected office. Um, it's not something I believed in. I didn't believe in government growing up. We didn't participate in it. When I tell you about my great grandma and her parents being colonizers and the colonized, like those were things that were very ingrained in me. And so I knew 
that the government represent represented that colonizing force. And so I didn't, I didn't believe in it, but I knew that it relies on us not paying attention. And I knew that without one of us on the inside to tell us what was going on, to basically snitch on their plans, then we were, we were never going to have a chance and we're being erased here in Denver. And so, you know, I just took all of those moments in my life where people told me I couldn't do something or something was impossible. And I just channeled it all. I channeled it all inside of myself. I reached out to every single person, you know, that I have felt invested in me that I have invested in, ask them for their advice, ask them if they would be supportive of it. And for so long, they had asked me to do it that by the time I asked them if they would be supportive, everybody was all in. They were like, let's do it. And so we, we won an impossible race. And now with a quarter of the resources, you know, which is what I was used to doing. I was used to winning with a quarter or none of the resources that anybody else had, that my competition had. And so my community prepared me, my life of disadvantage prepared me to fight the way that I fight now. And I believe that we're, we're changing things. I believe that even if I don't win every single thing that I vote on, our community is paying attention to what's happening in a way that they've never paid attention before. Our community is starting to realize what I realized in college when I said the game was rigged. And we're trying, we're now learning the rules of how to take that game over, how to flip that game off the table and decide if we want a new game, decide what we want to do about it. And what Stefan started the call with, you know, was his situation and how he was being ignored by the cops. Um, and when I found out about what happened to him, you know, those cops have to answer to me now. Those cops' budgets get approved by us. Those cops don't have a choice but to give me the reports when I ask for them. And for me to go in there, and demand and ask for information about my friend who I know doesn't have these affiliations, doesn't have any reason for someone to be out threatening his life. You know, it changed the way that they're treating him. It changed the way that they're treating the investigation. And that to me is, those are the important little changes that I have a responsibility to make on the inside now. Um, now that you are done, I have a question, and uh, I don't think nobody else is going to ask. I mean, it's not really a question, but um, uh, I want to say, like, thank you, because I do know that you do have that type of authority, because when I was going through my situation, my lawyer, when I was at court with Phil, my lawyer had told me, like, um, a lady named Sita Baca, she, she uh, cornered me, she had me in a corner, and she was telling me like, I need to do this for you and I need to get you off of this. I swear to God, in front of my grandma and my mom, like she was scared. I was like, yeah, Phil was laughing. It was crazy. I definitely appreciate how you have that authority. And it's I, crazy. Thank I you. want you to watch, I'm gonna send you a link of a video from Monday night. Um, it'll make you really proud because that's the same woman who is her boss um was asking us for money for probation officers in schools and on monday we stopped that contract so that probation officers are not in our schools anymore yes indeed yes indeed uh and stefan she, i see you got a question too yeah she stared me in the eyes and i was like <laughs> i told you about how i feel about your gun shit in these schools and she knew exactly um what i was talking about so it was it was a nice moment I, yeah. like, I, like i said i don't really have a it's not like a question it's just like a it's a thank you to candy from not even the adulthood it's like even even pushing us from in high school like 
if we were around in her class, like and you was in class with Candy, you was for if if you didn't pick up from her energy and push yourself, you're just an idiot. Like, but I'm gonna tell you this though, Candy, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to touch a year of college. I did go to college, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna tell you like it's because of people like you and Chantel that opened up my eyes, even as a black man, like. I ain't got to go kick it with the bros at the park. Like, no, I'm finna go hang out with them at lunchtime. Like, I'm finna go sit in there with y'all. Like, that's what I did. Like, it made it look weird to them, but I didn't give a damn. But I always have to thank you for that. Like, I swear I do. Like, <laughs> to this day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Margaret, did you have a question too? Or was no, that just... I didn't have. No, I didn't have a question. The, the claps, huh? <laughs> All right, do we have any, anybody have any more questions? No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank and, you. And I uh, just hope that every time um, you're thinking about, you know, what's next in life, think about that activity that we started the call with and think about how we see what we can, what we're intentional about focusing on. We make we can see possibilities instead of limitations when we focus on them and when we search for them and so if if i can do it any of us can do it and now that i'm here i'm here to help any of us um, in any way that i can and i just want all of you guys to know how much i rely on and value all of your stories it's your stories that yes, get do my work every day so thank all of you yes, yes indeed. thank you thank you um uh, candy if if we didn't hear nothing this whole time while you was talking what is one message that you can leave us with um it's all it's all a lie it's all a lie and they want us to believe the lie um but if we don't believe the lie we change everything we change mm -hmm. everything and we can be anything and do anything that we want. So mm -hmm. don't believe the lie. Um, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, go ahead, um, Aja, go ahead and wrap us up. Okay, so at the end of every story, we end it by um, snapping two times. So once I count to three, then we're all going to snap. So one, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you again oh. for sharing your story. Leon, thank you again, Candy, for coming in with us. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Thank you. Thank you. Support you, girl. Yes, indeed. Y'all have a good one. You too. Peace. Guzzo, love you. Love you too, bro. Huh?